Our lives are not about us. As we're just saying, it is all about you, Jesus. And may you continue to be on the forefront of our minds this morning as we open our Bibles and as we learn more about you. And as we learn to find out what the Bible says about the current issues of our time. Holy Spirit, please speak through me to glorify the Father and to strengthen and encourage your body, the church. Remove me from the equation. May it be as if you were speaking directly to everybody assembled here this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning uh, by talking about what I call the problem in the pulpit. As we continue our, we'll close our series on, or the topic, rather not the series, on transgenderism. There was an article that was entitled, How Compromised Preaching is Contributing, Contributing to Our Cultural Rot, by author Michael Brown. This was written on Tuesday, May 24th. It says, for many years, I have stated that a major reason America is so messed up, and if you have any sort of, if you have eyesight, it is plain to see America is pretty screwed up now. That much of, is messed up is that much of the American church is also messed up. And a major reason that so much of the American church is messed up is that so many Christian leaders are also messed up. The domino effect is quite real. And how exactly do church leaders influence their followers? They do it by their message and by their example. If they are preaching rightly and living rightly, they will produce healthy congregants. That's the idea of spiritual multiplication. If their preaching is unbiblical and their lifestyle is compromised, they'll produce unhealthy congregants. To be sure, America is not as influenced by the pulpit as it was in 1873 when Charles Finney preached that if the public press lacks moral discrimination, and I think it's safe to say that that's true today, if the church is degenerate and worldly, if the world loses its, its interest in religion, if Satan rules in our halls of legislation, Amen. if our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. What is even more concerning is the latest information from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University. Uh, Michael Brown goes on to write that just 37%, listen to that, just 37% of Christian pastors in the United States have a biblical worldview. It would be bad enough if less than 4 in 10 believers held to a biblical worldview, but less than 4 in 10 pastors, well, how can this be? Well, George Bonner stated that this evidence is another strong piece of evidence that the culture is influencing the American church more than Christian churches are influencing the culture. Now, we're seeing that play out. You notice that the last few years I have been preaching on this very issue. We have to begin to be a more stronger influence in our society. Brown goes on to say, or viewed from another angle, Rather than Christian leaders equipping their people to swim against the tide of the culture, they too are being carried by the current of the age. And that in turn means that the light is not shining and the salt is not being salty. In short, when the doctors are spreading disease rather than curing disease, the populace is in big trouble. As I wrote in 2017, we have believed that we should blend in and not rock the boat. 
showing the non-believers around us that we're no different than they are. But while it's important to be contributing members of the society, and while we're called to be peacemakers, not troublemakers, we're also called to swim against the tide and go against the grain. We are called to show the world a better way. Sadly, many Christian leaders have put more emphasis on discovering what's trending in society than learning what's on God's heart. In the quest to become relevant, they have become irrelevant. But without a doubt, when we see so much spiritual and moral confusion in the larger society, it reflects the moral and spiritual confusion found in many churches. And that, in turn, reflects the confused and compromised message emanating from Christian leaders around America. And I opened the sermon this morning with that introduction because a number of you came up to me two weeks ago at our potluck and thanked me for preaching the truth and for preaching on and talking about these difficult issues. Like transgenderism in this current sermon series. Well, the implication was that you're, and I've seen it online too, you just are not hearing much from the church about this issue. And I think you understand, if you remember from two weeks ago, that the extent of this transgender movement. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. I went to uh, see my father before he passed away and to be there for my mother, and I couldn't get away from transgenderism. In Athens County, Ohio, where Ohio University resides, it's heavily Democratic. One of the few Democratic counties in the state of Ohio, which is a conservative state. In Athens County, there is, you know, the, the big high schools would be Athens High School. Everybody heard of the name Joe Burrow, quarterback for the since I had Beagles in the Super Bowl, he went to Athens High School, okay? He went to Ohio State. He degenerated himself and went to LSU for a few years. <laughs> and so he purged himself by making it to the NFL from that cesspool of sin in Baton Rouge. That being said, um, next to Athens High School is Alexandria High School, where my niece went to school. My nieces and nephews went to school. The talk was that... A student uh, was identifying as a cat and demanded that cat litter be put in the restrooms in the high school. I'm not making this up. Well, Athens County, and Al or Athens in High School and Alexandria High School said no. The county right below Athens County, Meigs County, said yes. And so there was jokes being made about the schools in Meigs County because there's cat litter where this person has that there because they're identifying as a cat, okay? Either I heard it on a video or, uh, I'm not making this up, I heard it on a video or um, they were talking about it, you know, how I can't remember, I think it's kind of blurry right now. But these, there are, I got, apparently there are students that are identifying as cats. When asked to answer a question, they answer with, with a purr. And the teacher cannot fail them. But why not? That's their truth and that's the culture right now. It's everywhere. So, yeah, we're addressing these issues. You're not hearing much about it, but you need to know it is everywhere. And you need to know what the Bible says about it. Well, there's a part of you that is responsible for your walk with God. There's a part of me that is responsible for your walk with God as well, as the introduction points out. And specifically, you need to learn, as I need to learn, and we need to continue to be salt and light in a culture that is rapidly rotting away. And as we'll talk about this morning a little bit, does anyone know why the culture is rotting away? You want to take a guess? You're, we're under the judgment of God. This is what happens. Okay? 
So let's take a look at what the Bible says about transgenderism, because we looked at all those videos and all that stuff two weeks ago, just to try to get you up to date of what's going on and that it is everywhere. But um, let's talk about what the Bible says about this. Look at the Old Testament and transgenderism. We looked at this verse last week, or two weeks ago. A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall man put on woman's clothing. Whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. I said to you that for Moses to write this, what does that mean? It was happening in his time. So transgenderism is nothing new. Now how does God feel about transgenderism? Well, do you remember what the word abomination means? It's detestable to God. So any cross-dresser, cross-dresser, or drag queen, or queer, any transgender person is an abomination to God that he finds morally disgusting. Now, well, why? Why does he find them morally disgusting? They're his creation. Well, God created humanity distinctively what? Male and female. And to blur the lines of sex distinction is so serious to God that it uses some of the strongest language available to him. Abomination. The, what, can you think of another time that God uses the word abomination? Think of AOD, the abomination of desolation. Daniel talks about that. That's when Satan, sends, we think it's Satan that sets him up to be worshipped in the temple. That's an abomination to God that brings his wrath. So it's a very strong word. Okay? And our society and our culture is trying to force it upon you that this is normal. Let me give you another reason why God views transgenderism as an abomination. In 1 John five nineteen, we read this. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, Satan had been given, or has been given control of this world. Did you know that? Remember that? This is his world for now. And his strategy is simple. He will counter or oppose anything that is from God. Where God says separate, that's heterosexuality, right? Satan inspires to unite. Homosexuality. Man and man, women and women, separate. The world says, unite. Where God says men and women dress uniquely, Satan says men and women dress similarly. And Satan knows that this behavior, transgenderism in particular this morning, is detestable to God and brings about the destruction of humanity. So he moves to empower this perverted agenda. That's his strategy. But God loves his creation and sent his son to save the world. He desires that no man perish, but all men come to faith in Jesus Christ. So it is not only the behavior of transgenderism that God finds detestable, but also the consequence of the behavior, the destruction of his creation that he dearly loves. And how much does God love his creation? He sent his son to die for it. Now we also find this in Deuteronomy 23.1. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Yes, folks, even back in the time of the Old Testament, in paganism, they were performing transition surgeries. People who did this weren't called transgender. Remember what they were called? Eunuchs. In ancient times, people were castrated to their gods. Some to serve the king in any capacity that the king saw fit, i.e. in a harem, for example, knowing there wouldn't be any threat to the, the, the king's concubines or wives. Or they were castrated to become temple prostitutes, male prostitutes to be raped by male worshipers. Some nations did this to children as early as before the age of 10. Now, does that sound familiar, what's going on today? 
Anyone who had gender transition surgery was not to enter the assembly of the Lord. What does that mean? You're not to be among God's people. And this is a very strong warning here in Deuteronomy, clearly expressing God's view of transgenderism, of transition surgery, and of the transgender movement overall. This is not an issue that is unclear in the Bible. Okay? But let's say you, know, you, you are no longer confused about your sexual identity, and you finally embrace your sex at birth. Was there any way back to God? And the answer is a resounding yes. I think I put this verse up here for us. It's Isaiah 56, 3 through 5. If you can read that, great. If not, get your Bibles out and turn there to it. But this is, a, uh, this is hope. This is hope. And this is a, a very good thing. It says, Not let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. The eunuch is not to say, I am a dry tree. Now, what does that mean? What is a dry tree? A dry tree is another word for what? It's a dead tree, right? Unfruitful. It's a dead tree. And dead trees, they have no life in them, and they're always cut down and thrown in the fire. And the eunuch, Isaiah is saying, well, the Lord is saying through Isaiah, is not to think, I can have no hope of eternal life. If the eunuchs who come to the true God in repentance, they keep my Sabbaths, they live a pleasing life to God, and hold fast to God's covenant, they have hope. God, in fact, has a special place for the eunuch. See that? He has a special place for the transgender. He will not just accept them on the fringes, but in his house, within his walls, there is a memorial. In other words, God will remember them by writing their names down as a part of the family in his house. Oh, isn't that good news? And they will have a name better than that of sons and daughters because they weren't just born in, they were adopted in. God will give them an everlasting name. So the transgender person they can be converted and come into the kingdom of God. And that's kind of in a, in a nutshell what the Old Testament says about transgenderism. Well, we can at least get in, in a, a sermon on Sunday morning. What does the New Testament say about transgenderism? Well, okay, look at this. So it look familiar, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's another way of saying the unrighteous or the eunuch or the transgender, they don't belong amongst God's people. They're not part of the assembly of the Lord. Same as the Old Testament. They don't inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church, discusses the kind of people who are in that church. Okay? But it's also in every church. And these are people who have been converted from all kinds of sinful backgrounds. Look at the list of sins that stood up there. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but it is representative of a number of sins, okay? Now, notice the word effeminate. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means literally in, in the Greek, it's the word soft. Like we would say, I have soft clothing or a soft pillow, okay? It does not refer to an effeminate man. For example, in the Old Testament, Esau, Jacob had his sons, right? Or actually, it was Isaac had two sons. Esau and Jacob. 
Esau would have been considered a masculine man because it says in Genesis 25, 27, so the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. We would say that he would be um, a man's man. He would be you know, a daddy's boy, okay? What we would think of masculinity. A skillful hunter, a man of the field. And then there's Jacob. He would have been considered a feminine man. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Esau was a sportsman. Jacob liked being around the home. Jacob would be considered a mama's boy. Now, the same could probably be said of in the New Testament of Timothy, Paul's disciple. He was raised by his grandmother and mother and struggled with what? Fearful and timid spirit. Remember that? But both Jacob and Timothy are where right now? They're in the kingdom of God. So what does Paul mean when he refers to the effeminate in 1 Corinthians 6? Did I even put the, yeah, I did. Put that verse up there. Well, used in the sexual sense, which is the context here, it refers to the passive partner in a homosexual relationship or the cross-dresser or the transgender person. And it's clear, they don't inherit the kingdom of God. So is there hope offered for the transgender person in the New Testament? Well, that's 1 Corinthians 6.11. Look at this. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. Such were some of you. So some of the people in the Corinthian church practice a sexual immoral lifestyle, they worshiped false idols. They were in adulterous relationships. They lived a life consumed with greed. They were alcoholics. They regularly slandered others. They extorted people, probably for money. Some were transgender and some were homosexual. But that was their old lifestyle. They changed. They were converted from sinners to saints because Paul now calls them saints in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Listen to this. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. So they were saints. So they were sinners, now they're saints. They were, for example, a transvestite. Now they're a saint. They were homosexual. Now they're heterosexual. They were a thief, now they're honest. Does that make sense? Now this verse, verse 11 of chapter 6, is proof that God changes lives. And folks, in any condition, is not permanent. And this verse is eyewitness testimony that refutes the lie that a homosexual is born gay and cannot change. This verse is eyewitness testimony that refutes the argument that a transgender person is born into the wrong body and cannot change. God does not make mistakes when he creates a person, male or female. But, well, how did they change then? That's the key point. How did they change? Well, it says they were washed, sanctified, and justified. Now, what do those terms mean? Every one of us is a sinner who needs to be washed clean from their sins. And the, in fact, the word washed there, it's like a deep cleaning or a thorough washing. It's been washed clean of your sins. Second, you need to be sanctified. Once the filthy sin is washed away, the Lord implants his holy, eternal life in you, so you are now a new creation. That's sanctified. And finally, you're justified. God declares you as righteous as he is, by crediting Christ's righteousness to your account. You are now as holy and as righteous as God is by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is how every sinner is converted into a saint. And that's a work of God. It is a divine miracle. 
And this is what the church is called to do. We convert sinners into saints. Let's look at a New Testament example of a transgender conversion. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. You know it by a different name. We could call it Philip and the, the transvestite, but it's called Philip and the eunuch. Acts chapter 8. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? He told him, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water. What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered that the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. I'd like you to think of the word transgender when you see the word eunuch in that story. Now, this eunuch or this transgender was someone who was, by choice, physically emasculated for the service of his gods and his queen. Now, he had risen to a, a prominent position in the service of his queen as he's in charge of all her treasure. Now, what's interesting is that he is on his way from Jerusalem where he had worshipped. Now, he was probably a Gentile, meaning he was a foreigner. He was also transgender. And he would have been considered not only unclean to the Jews for being a Gentile, because they considered Gentiles lowly dogs, but also an, an abomination who was not allowed by the law to be among the people because he was eunuch. He was transgender. In the eyes of an Orthodox Jew, he was unsavable. but not to God. And this is why this story is in the Bible. And that's precisely why God has Luke, I think, include this story. Out of all the stories of salvation in the early church, in his account of the Acts of the Apostles, God puts this story in. Now this, was, this eunuch or this transgender was reading Isaiah 53. Perhaps he had thought that his life was over. Perhaps he had read Isaiah 56, like we just looked at this morning. He learned that he's not a dead tree. And since Isaiah's God is associated with Jerusalem, he went there to worship. And as he's reading Isaiah 53 on his way back to Ethiopia, he's reading a chapter that describes the Son of God. He simply doesn't understand what he is reading. I like that because oftentimes when I read the Bible, I don't understand what I'm reading. So God brings this seeker a man who will share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In obedience to the Lord at the appropriate time, Philip intervenes and began to explain to him the scriptures and the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful story. Here is a dry tree, a hopeless pagan, 
And he finds out that God, the God of the Israelites, will accept him. Because isn't that what the transgender person is ultimately wrestling with? Acceptance? They're not accepting their, their biological body. And here they can find a God who will accept them for who they are. In fact, this, this person has probably been stigmatized his entire life. He can't reverse physically what it was done. His conscience is torturing him under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And if he did read Isaiah 56, he found that God will just will welcome him into his family, give him a memorial name, make him a permanent occupant of his home, give him everlasting life. And now he finds out through Philip that all of that comes through Jesus Christ. And the gospel message Philip preached was probably this. Repent, believe, and be baptized. Baptism is a part of the gospel message. It's, you're saved by your faith, but as an evidence of your faith, you want to obey the Lord and you want to be baptized. So the transgender believes with all his heart, is baptized, and rejoices. And folks, this is what we do. We offer devastated people the gospel of conversion from sinner to saint through faith in Christ that ultimately brings them joy. And this New Testament story is a living illustration of the promise that Isaiah gave in Isaiah chapter 56. So both the Old and the New Testament are clear about the sin of transgenderism, including transitional clothing, any type of transitional surgery. It's an abomination to God, utterly detestable to him. It makes you ineligible to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And why? Because it confuses sexual identity. Now there is this, though, which I just simply call our reality. Um, our, I guess you can call it neighbors of the north, Canada passed Bill C-4, which makes it a crime to offer to a transgender person or a homosexual person any kind of conversion therapy. Now, what do we mean by conversion therapy? Someone doesn't want to be, if you are you know, struggling with your, your, your gender identity or your, your sexual identity, and you don't want to struggle, and you want to go back to what your real your, your sex at birth, or if you're homosexual and you don't think you are and you want to go back to being heterosexual, you can go to people, counselors, churches, whatever, and be converted back. That's conversion therapy. Now, there's actually a process that they take you through. I don't know if that's good or not. All I know is that if God's at work in your life, God will transform you. That's the real conversion that we're talking about here. But anyways, you can't offer any kind of conversion therapy. It's a crime punishable by up to five years in prison to attempt to convert a transgender person or homosexual. Now, two weeks ago, I also revealed to you that the United States, under the Obama administration, has written laws that protect the transgender. Remember the story of that uh, lady, that young girl, that the grandparents who adopted her misgendered her, and the, the girl was just abused by the system. And it started with the Obama administration. They began to write laws to protect the transgender. And I just want to simplify this for you. Our government and that particular administration, the current administration in the White House, are encouraging a lifestyle that is a mental illness. And there are plenty of medical and research and biological institutions that believe this. You can find them on their websites. but it's a mental illness which has led the radicals in this transgender movement to indoctrinate and groom children of all ages to this mentally ill transgender lifestyle. And I believe the United States is inching closer in its laws to what Canada has already passed in Bill C-4. It's a crime to offer any conversion therapy to a transgender or homosexual person. But here's our reality. The ministry of conversion is the reason the church is in the world. 
It has always been this way. In the Old Testament, David wrote this, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. From sinner to saint. In the New Testament, James wrote this about conversion. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's conversion. Now in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, I reviewed a list of sins. Sexual immorality, the actual word there is the Greek word porneia. When we get our word pornography, it refers to all kinds of sexual morality, i.e. a sexually immoral lifestyle. We talked about idolatry, the worship of, of other gods. Adultery, we know what that is. Stealing, greed, drunkenness, slander, or swindlers, or extortionists. Now here's the thing, and maybe I'm wrong, and you can, can correct me on this. To my knowledge, I haven't heard about any laws that the government is making to prevent us from trying to convert those in a sexual moral lifestyle, to convert those in worship of false gods, to convert adulterers, thieves, the greedy, alcoholics, slanderers, or extortionists. In fact, there are laws that punish that type of behavior. Why are there laws protecting the transgender and the homosexual? Society rightly recognizes that these behaviors, being a thief, adultery destroys a family, extorting people out of their money and so on, they're detrimental to society. That is why we have AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. This is why there are laws punishing thieves and those who swindle the vulnerable out of their money. But our government and other governments around the world make laws to protect two of these categories, the effeminate, the transgender, and the homosexual. And why is the government doing that? I believe it's because the government is under the influence of Satan himself. That's the only way I can understand this. Satan knows the damage done by these sins is massive. I mean, it is so destructive. Because it, what does it destroy? Human identity, marriage, family, children, and ultimately, society. And which then brings the ultimate judgment of God. When we violate, when a nation violates God's laws, there is not up for debate. History tells us God brings judgment on these nations. Look at, read Isaiah, read Jeremiah. Chapter after chapter after chapter. Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, and you name it, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, in the New Testament we find the judgment of God on these nations that have violated his laws. Now, Romans 1, and we're just going to fly through this in about two minutes, it tells us in detail what the judgment of God looks like and kind of how it plays out. And it begins with a nation rejecting God. That's Romans 1, 18 to 23. God then gives a nation up to sexual morality. That's Romans 1, 24. And I'm going through this quickly because I've been through this before with you guys. Then he gives them up to homosexuality. That's Romans 1, 26 to 27. Then he gives them up to a depraved mind. And this is what I want to focus on. It's Romans 1, 28. So you go from rejection of the truth of God to a sexual revolution, to a homosexual revolution, to a debased or depraved mind. Now what is a depraved mind? And this is the key. A depraved mind is an insane mind. Do you understand what I mean when I say an insane mind? That means that that mind does not function in accordance with reality. Because truth is what? That which 
is in accordance with reality. That's the actual definition of truth, okay? And if you are crazy, if you are insane, you have lost touch with reality. So when you reject the truth of God, he gives you over to that through, through these, these cycles, all right? You reject, you suppress the truth of me, you reject my truth, okay? Then you're gonna need something. So you're gonna go for feelings, so you go for sex, which leads to more perverse sex, homosexuality. Then at that point in time, if you don't repent, I give you over to a mind that simply cannot think clearly. You have lost touch with reality, okay? Part of the judgment of God, I want you everyone to look at me, part of the judgment of God on a nation is he gives people over to insanity. And he gives them over to insanity, to a mental illness, because he sealed his judgment upon them. They cannot turn back. Do you understand that? Try and reason with an insane person. You can't. So that insanity that we have been seeing the past few years, okay, that's simply the judgment of God playing itself out. That's why you have these, these, you know, these talk shows and these news, and they sit there and they throw out reason and logic to these people, and it does absolutely nothing to bring about any change because the people are insane. They're crazy. You're no longer rational. Now, why do I say that? Well, because a transgender person, for example, doesn't know whether they are male or female. How insane can you be if you cannot tell if you are male or female, right? That's a depraved mind. They have lost touch with reality. And the sobering part, all of it, again, that, that becomes in itself a judgment. And we have front row seats to this playing out in our lifetime. Because when our nation starts making laws to protect people who are mentally ill and are a danger to themselves and others in society, namely vulnerable, impressionable children. And I've showed you that two weeks ago. And the transgender movement does not want the truth about their agenda to see the light of day. Last Thursday, June 1st, the video, What is a Woman, premiered. I showed you two weeks ago from Matt Walsh that video documentary, the, the introduction to it, the, the promo for it. The company that made the video, Daily Wire, um, received a record number of users streaming the film uh, last Thursday, June 1st. But according to Ben Shapiro, here is what happened. Our site experienced heavy technical difficulties and many were unable to watch. Why? No, it's not praise Lord, that's not a good thing. Well, why? They have since determined that we were hit with a significant and sustained DDoS cyber attack. I don't know what that means, Frank, you could help me. It was a cyber attack aimed at preventing you from seeing Matt Walsh's shocking new documentary, What is a Woman? So what's the big deal about this documentary? Why are there forces, by the way, here's the documentary, it was the preview before, it's called What is a Woman? So what's the big deal about this documentary? Why are there forces that don't want it to see the light of day? Matt Walsh went to every public intellectual on the left he could find from Harvard professors to feminist activists at the Women's March, and asked simple questions, the main one being, what is a woman? Because we cannot have a society together if you can't do something as simple as define the word woman, the answers he got will horrify you. They reveal just how dangerous and destructive radical gender ideology is and the impact it's having on women and children in our society. 
this was so important that I went in and got subscription to the Daily Wire, and I made our family made. They, we were all glued to the TV watching this 90-minute documentary. It was that good. So much that I made my mother-in-law watch it the following night. May her stay there till what, 11 o'clock at night or something like that? Okay. And so I've talked to Frank, and this Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the church in the fellowship hall, you can come and watch it. And I want you to be there. I want you to change your schedules if you can. I want you to invite your neighbors. It is not, this is not like a gospel presentation type thing. It's simply this man, who I think might be a believer, asking a simple question, what is a woman? You will see if you've been to my biblical worldview class, you'll recognize the postmodernism in the answers these people give. So seven o'clock, this Wednesday in the fellowship hall, bring something to drink. Maybe we can have coffee there, but I mean, you bring popcorn if you want. But I would ask you to invite anybody you want and make this a priority if you can. It'll probably go from seven to nine because it's about a 90 minute video, maybe a little brief discussion afterwards. But we were all, I think, kind of, would you say, those of you who saw it in my family, it was really good. It was, we were transfixed on it, okay? And it was shocking. It was heartbreaking to see what this movement is doing, particularly to young women. And they are targeting children. And so, what is a woman? We will show it here in the Fellowship Hall, Wednesday at 7. And so it's, it's, I thought I could get away from it, going to Ohio, and it is everywhere, folks. It is everywhere. There was a new video that just came out the other day. People in Dallas, a gay bar, hosted a drag queen night and it was, they were bringing children, infants, toddlers to this, and they gave them money to the toddlers to give the drag queens as they were walking up and down. There were parents, anyone see that? There were parents, men, they're outside protesting against that, okay? This is Texas, folks, okay? There is hope. For, for these people. But if you're going to go against the tide that we talked about in the introduction, you're going to have to do what the people of Jasper, Indiana did. The community was sponsoring, I don't know how they did it, a, a, a pride transgender movement event. A mother found out. She contacted via social media all these other mothers, the concerned parents. They sent it to the, the Twitter site Lives of TikTok, who put it out. The Daily Wire picked up on it and reported on it. And the community pressured the people that put this in place, and they canceled the event. State Farm found out they were giving money to an organization that was uh, funding, I think it was books, that had a book about uh, being a queer and so on to young children. And they got such feedback from their employees, they publicly withdrew the, the money to that organization. They are doing these things, they are hiding these things from us, and now they're being exposed. And if you want to see some change, just to protect children in general, you're going to have to get involved in community projects, on school boards. The Athens County Schools in the, in the Alexander High School had a conservative superintendent that the liberals forced out. So they're all liberals on this board now, and that school, pardon my language, has gone to hell. It is a woke school that pushes this liberal agenda that my niece is now transitioning. To hear her voice. That's why I'm telling you, it is everywhere. And so, I encourage you, clear your schedules if you can. I thought this this morning and we're going to offer it and Thank God that Frank's available because that would not operate anything over there. So bring your own food, drinks, popcorn, whatever. And it's, um, it's not 
perverted or anything. It's a very entertaining and it's very eye-opening, frustrating, and yet we need to know this stuff. And it was also, in the end, very encouraging that there are, we just need to be aware of this. Amen? So we can be salt and light. And so here's what we obviously would do. I said pray for our children, right? Now you need to pray for your children and for our schools. Let's stand and let's sing. Father, thank you for this time this morning in our worship and study of your word. We simply want to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. So I pray that we would deeply surrender to you and to this, really to the Holy Spirit, that he would fill us and empower us to be more, to be a light that shines brighter, to be even more salter to the a world that is decaying and rotting before our very eyes. Father, we recognize that we are under your judgment, but it doesn't mean that you can't use us to save those who are going down in a sinking ship. Use us for that purpose, we pray, to bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.